A man named Riley Tillian notices something strange happening within the walls and corners of his own home. He would soon begin investigating and documenting said strangeness. While a regular human being would be alarmed at this unnatural anomaly, Tillian takes the opportunity to study and theorize on the phenomena. On October 20th, 2011, Riley would upload the first video about his documentation of the phenomena. The video would be titled, Corner Folk. Many dimensions intersect with their own, several of which are 2D planes. When two or more planes intersect, they form corners. Entities in the intersecting planes cannot perceive each other. They exist separately, in their own worlds. However, the corner folk can pass these boundaries and enter other planes. The corner folk are a trans-dimensional species. They are the only ones who can traverse the corners shaped by planes. Coincidentally, I believe that the corners of my own home align with several planes, for I have seen the corner folk in action, crossing the corners from one reality to another. This leap requires massive amounts of energy that, when released, produces bright blue flashes. I have yet to discover the source of this energy, and the reason behind the cornerful crossings remains unknown. While I was at work, my cameras captured up to 12 corner folk huddling in the doorway. I used to think that they had to cross dimensions quickly but the new footage has proven otherwise. When I'm not around, they take a break from traveling and exhibit micro-movements similar to dreaming animals. They must feel safe in these corners, which suggests that the corner folk's own home is made of similar structures. I imagine that their corner world is made of many plane intersections, allowing them to move freely without using up any energy. My photographs show that smaller corner folk have odd impressions on their skin, as though they had been pressed against many plane intersections at once. The corners likely belong to a nursery or a crib in their home world. A multitude of corners placed in close proximity could be used to secure the infant from leaving the corner world. Perhaps they only cross corners in search of food, the same way we only leave our homes for resources. The corner world may be used to raise young, while my own house's corners serve as rest stops of sorts during their journeys. Odd human-like interdimensional beings flashing in and out of existence around the corners of his rooms. He believes that the reason why these interdimensional beings are visible to him is because the world they come from intersects with ours. Specifically, it intersects exactly in the corners of his own home. Because of this, Tillian suspects that the world must be made of multiple intersecting dimensions, a whole world made up of crossed planes, creating many corners, a corner world. He thinks that the beings are invisible to us in our three-dimensional space. Only once they jump from one plane to the next that they are visible, and only once they take rest stops in these corners that we can see them. This curiosity and intrigue would turn into obsession, as Riley begins spending more and more time being engulfed with what the results of his investigations could imply. He was onto something, but this obsession would become the end of him. I've begun to dream of the corner world. I can't stop thinking about it. According to the calendar, I've spent entire weeks in my home, just drawing and describing the corner world on paper. I lost my job last month due to repeated absences. 
but it really does feel like I just left the office this afternoon. When the corner folk jump, it feels as though they're taunting me. But I'm close to a solution. Regardless of whether my body survives the forces of the corner world or not, this much is certain. The fear of my own destruction will not prevent my entry. What are we waiting for? Let's bring them back home. Instead of dying in a brutal car crash in 1955, James Dean lived on and became the 39th president of the United States of America. Winning over 300 electoral votes and being inaugurated on January 20th, 1969. It was said that in the seconds following James Dean's presidential announcement, Hundreds of thousands of neighborhoods erupted into celebration. Although other candidates had promised to end the Vietnam War, none had so accurately expressed the same anger they had felt, which Dean had perfectly conveyed in a 15-second broadcast. Although a presidential debate was eventually scheduled two weeks before the election, James Dean instead invited opponent Richard Nixon to a track to race cars on the same night. Reluctant at first, Nixon eventually agreed and went to spend the entire day with Dean, reportedly even telling the actor, to hell with it, I'm voting for you, you're already a better president than I'll ever be. You might be wondering, what does any of this have to do with the corner folk? Well, in order for us to understand what the corner folk are and where they come from, we need to first understand the overall story of the monument mythos. Unlike Riley Tillian, who is allegedly from our world encountering interdimensional beings from other worlds, the story of the monument mythos is told to us by a mysterious Alex Kansas. Through his YouTube channel, Alex transmits to us his documentational series by the name of the monument mythos. See, Alex is from another universe. In his world, history goes a lot different than in ours and things turn out a lot more grimmer and stranger also. Due to a world-ending cataclysmic event, Alex finds himself thrown in our universe, having shifted from one dimension to another. Landing here on October 1st, 2016, Alex begins uploading videos episodically on a YouTube channel by the name of Mr. Mandacore. Alex is our Sethanaut. He is a dimension traveler tasked with coming here and informing us or warning us about what had happened in his world. For starters, before we dive in, we first have to understand some key differences between the worlds. In Alex's universe, both James Dean and John D. Rockefeller served as presidents of the United States and both played a key role in influencing world events that we'll come to see soon. America went through a very different 1960s, both politically and technologically, as well as the fact that in Alex's world, there's something seriously wrong happening behind closed doors. Dangerous creatures and powers lay hidden underneath the earth and around monuments throughout the world. Some are even hiding in plain sight. There are supernatural beings flying across the US causing havoc, terrorist organizations fighting the US government, Mega corporations hiding dangerous secrets. Strange giant floating heads floating around the Grand Canyon. Island-sized self-duplicating organisms. Statues that come alive. And ancient indestructible trees with menacing powers. 
On top of all this, something big is slithering underneath America, ready to break out. It's an absolute mess for anyone looking outside in, but once everything is explained and all the dots are connected, the Monument Mythos turns into one of the most intriguing interconnected internet horror series out there. The Mythos uses both the medium of analog horror and alternative history to tell a story unlike anything else even breaking the fourth wall and connecting us directly with this fictional world through Alex. And it's divided into multiple chapters. In this video, we'll be mainly focusing on three of them, season one and two of the mythos and the corner folk. The fourth and last one, well, we'll save that one for its own video because that is a whole universe on its own. But for now, we can begin our journey down the rabbit hole that is Alex's universe. When James Dean was elected, the nation had experienced record high joys and happiness. Many were glad to see such a young face sitting in the most important seat in the country. Dean became way more loved and popular with the American people than he ever was being an actor. Due to this admiration, many saw him as a perfect president. But not everybody felt the same way. In fact, some hated Dean just as much as the rest of the American people had loved him. One of the most notable of these Dean haters were an extremist terrorist group known as the Anti-Dean Association, or the ADA for short. During electoral campaigns for Nixon and Dean, the ADA would go about hijacking radios and cutting power lines to stop Dean's infamous campaign ads. When that failed, they even went on to hack television stations, broadcasting messages defaming Dean, and even going as far as calling him Satan in disguise. But even though the ADA's actions could be seen as extreme, anyone with eyes to see and ears to hear knew that there was more things taking place behind closed doors than first scenes, and that the US government and Dean himself were hiding something that was no good. After all, strange things have been taking place near national monuments for decades now. Reports of people disappearing near the Washington Monument, the Liberty Statue, and the Lincoln Memorial have raised many eyebrows, but most just waved it off as coincidences and nothing more. Those that did try to expose it, like the ADA, were deemed as terrorists and quickly taken care of. Around the same time that this was taking place, a new corporation known as Maze Machines were well on their way to become the top technological conglomerate in America, developing the fastest computer on earth back in the 60s and after a disastrous attack by the ADA that hijacked air sirens across the USA, causing mass hearing damage throughout the population, Dean would quickly create a new branch of government known as the Department of Technology, which used government funding with Maze technological development to mass produce hearing aid kits for the American people, which put Maze as a new target for the ADA, as now, Maze were as much of a problem as Dean and the US government, that they have all become one and the same. Once Dean was out of office, the Anti-Dean Association would soon change their name into the Anti-Device Association, focusing more of their efforts towards exposing the Maze Corporation and their shady dealings as well as all the strange things taking place around the US monuments. For a while now, immigrants entering New York City who went through the Ellis Island Immigration Center have complained of an extremely bad slaughterhouse-like smell near the Statue of Liberty. Some even went on to claim that at night, they saw immigrants be led inside the statue's pedestal, never to be seen again. Same thing would happen near the Lincoln statue. Many visitors would hear strange noises coming from within it. Others even claiming that the statue had a secret use, which was a form of prison cell that was used to punish a special few. And the Washington Monument, strange things are bound to happen near it also. From 1910 to 1972, at least 20 people have gone missing around it. These people were known as the Washington Absentees. 
Some even claim that the Washington Monument was built around a strange tall dead tree that used to emit a weird noise, a tree that needed constant sacrifices to be made for it, and that the Washington Monument is but a form of cage or cover to keep it secret. Let's just say the ADA were right in wanting to expose what was taking place around these monuments. By the year 1977, after hearing some intelligence about an alleged anomalous property of another monument, this time the Freedom Statue on top of the Capitol, the ADA attempted an insurrection, storming the US Capitol armed with weapons. The information they received was around a series of events that took place while the statue was being made and transported in 1858, events that have been kept secret and covered up for all these years. Through witness statements from Detective Zafino, the captain of the Monarco, the ship that transported the statue, Commissioner H. Morgan, who was there at the scene, and Thomas Crawford, the sculptor of the statue's wife's testimony and daughter's diary, we know the events that took place while creating and transporting the Statue of Freedom. Allegedly, when Thomas Crawford was tasked with sculpting a Statue of Freedom for the Americans, he accepted. But Thomas only wanted to use the best of materials. The blade, he was gonna make that out of the highest quality glass he knew, Giza glass. Giza glass was discovered by European Egyptologists and archaeologists in the 1800s. But the ancient Egyptians and the local tribes had used it and kept it secret for thousands of years. The glass would only appear after mysterious lightning strikes hit the sand near the pyramids of Giza, forming a glass unlike anything else. And so Thomas went to Egypt to get some. When he came back to Livorno, Italy, Thomas would soon discover the anomalous properties of the glass. After cutting the tip of his finger off by accident and discovering that his finger was severed off without blood or pain and that he could still feel and even move it while it was severed, this discovery would become his obsession. As Thomas slowly started chopping off pieces of himself until one day he disappeared. His wife claimed that Thomas had chopped himself up and stuffed himself inside the statue. The statue would be put onto the Monarco, ready to be shipped from Italy to the US. Witness statements from the ship's captain and the commissioner tell us what had happened from their point of view onwards. The captain writes that after 10 days of leaving Italy, the ship had mysteriously taken a lot of damage to its hull, that it forced the captain to take a stop at Port Gibraltar in Spain to repair it. When officers came by to examine what the ship contained, they discovered that the statue's boxes were all empty. On the morning after, the local police had received numerous reports regarding a tremendous force that rushed up the Gibraltar rock, which tore down hundreds of trees and created several landslides throughout the previous night. When Commissioner Morgan and his team went to investigate, they found a huge trail going through the dense foliage, stretching the entire height of the rock. This trail was astonishingly linear and the cuts to the trees were precise. Some of the downed trees were even warm to the touch. A team of officers kept heading up the mountain until they stumbled on an entrance to a large crevice in the ground that led to an underground cavern. When the men lowered themselves down the cave, they had found the giant 19 foot tall plaster statue in the middle with a hollowed out torso stretched across the statue with human remains and Nina's diary on the ground. Through Nina's diary, she wrote about hearing strange noises throughout the ship and that one day when she was out looking for food and scraps, she came face to face with a statue that somehow was out of its box. She said that the statue had her father's eyes and that she felt her father's energy around it. She writes that as the ship took a stop at the dock, the statue broke out of its box again and took Nina with it. It held her as it ran through the jungle, its sword cutting hundreds of trees. She couldn't see much in the dark, but she did see her father's eyes staring down at her from those metal eyelids. After a while, they went down a hole to a deep cave. Once there, Freedom started a fire by hitting its arms against rocks. She writes, 
It's been sharpening its sword on the rocks for hours now, but it has not ever looked down at its blade. That since she started writing on her diary, the thing with her dad's eyes has been staring at her. The statue was picked up from the cave and shipped back to the US. After finding out about this, the ADA would shoot the statue down, causing the statue itself to awaken and go on a rampage killing around 150 people, proving that their intel and that the statue's anomalous properties were all real. The deaths were all blamed on the statue falling and killing all the people once hitting the ground. The US government quickly covered up the incident and Dean himself ordered that the statue would be taken to the Grand Canyon so that it would be out of danger and not a threat to anybody. Freedom was set to roam free in the Grand Canyon. This would be the first time that an anomalous property would happen in public and in broad daylight, proving everything that the ADA preached for so long. Alex gives us all this information episodically and in parts. A lot of things are kept secret and others are left for viewers, us, to interpret. In episode 4 of season 2, we are told by whistleblower Leonard Merlin, a former senior advisor, that when the US government found out about Giza glass in the 1800s, they went on to investigate the site. Once they discovered that Giza glass is formed by unusual lightning strikes, they quickly discovered that the lightning was not coming from the skies, instead from the pyramids themselves. And so an excavation of the pyramids began. After weeks of digging, Leonard tells us that the Americans kept finding more and more bricks and found that the pyramids had extended much deeper into the sand. The more they dug, the more bricks they found until they realized that the pyramids extended down infinitely. The pyramids were not pyramids, they were tips of towers, towers that contained enormous species of metaphysical flora and towers that seemed to go down into the earth infinitely. The pyramids were nothing more than containers of these giant dead looking trees and the lightning came from them. Allegedly the ancient Egyptians had knowledge of this thousands of years ago and the pharaohs had appointed special workers called guardians who would spend years of their lives striking these trees. They were equipped with the finest Giza glass blades hitting the trees for several nights in a row. The goal was not to cut them down because the trees were indestructible, instead it was to inhibit their upward growth. The Egyptians would then have enough time to build enormous towers that would better contain them. These towers became the pyramids. Once the US found this out, they went on to do the same with their special trees back home. One of them is known today as the Washington Monument explaining all the anomalous things that have been taking place around it. And so by this point in the Deanverse, freedom is raining havoc in the Grand Canyon, the Washington Monument has a giant megaflora tree inside of it with immense destructive powers and by 1985, the first sight of whatever was inside the Liberty statue is seen for the first time. A being that will be known as the Liberty Lurker. Following this Liberty Lurker incident, interviews and documents surrounding the creation of the Liberty statue are leaked, showcasing blueprints for extensive renovations that the statue had went through in 1949. And that the main point of these renovations were to quote unquote provide entrance for sustenance and install engine to assist with eventual departure for a creature that lives on the ground and uses the Liberty statue as an opening to be fed through. The statue had been outfitted with an engine at the base, an axle going up the length of the pedestal, wheels at the top, a secret side entrance that led to a room with a drain and a waste storage area. When authorities investigated the area after the incident, they discovered a mass grave in a waste storage area. 
a mass grave that is most likely made up of all the people who were brought into the monument. Whatever this Liberty Lurker thing is, it's big, dangerous, and hungry for human life. Five years prior to the Liberty Lurker incident, two siblings named Maya and Nathaniel Olnerdson, who had ties with the Anti-Device Association, would go on an infiltration mission to investigate a maze manufacturing plant. Once they made it to the basement, they found that the plant had a massive cave system underneath it, caverns that went on for thousands of miles, and when they went deeper in, they discovered the Horned Serpent a giant serpent-shaped monstrosity with immense power. This undiscernibly large creature was speculated to span the entirety of the USA in length and the connection was made that the reason maize were growing so fast across the US is because they were using the immense electrical power this creature was creating to power their technology, allowing them to grow much bigger and faster than their competition. And following the Liberty Lurker incident, the ADA would go about connecting that the Liberty statue was nothing but a hidden opening for the serpent, built right next to the Ellis Island Immigration Station to allow the US government to feed it with new immigrants every night and keep it docile. This revelation would split the ADA and a new splinter faction is formed called the Advocates for the Division of America, a fallout doomsday cult who worship this horned serpent as if it were a god believing it to be none other than George Washington himself, the founding father. They plan to destroy Earth through all means necessary to break the underground serpent out of its shell, aka planet Earth. And they were planning on achieving this goal by all means necessary, even if it meant their own destruction. Rockefeller being the president of the US at the time and having previous encounters with these special trees knew about the properties of their material ordering the confiscation of every piece of Giza glass from all American ambassadors that had received it after the British Museum gave them away as a token of international diplomacy. He would be suggested by many members of his administration to use the glass in warfare, though Rockefeller would quickly deny this and instead tried to come into an agreement with the head of the Department of Interior. After various conferences, they would come to the agreement that Greco-Egyptian tall swordsmen would wield swords made out of Giza glass and protect various forbidden zones in the Grand Canyon. These Giza guardians would go about attacking anybody who gets in their area. They were tasked with protecting, decapitating hundreds of people. This would in turn cause a problem for Rockefeller 
As all the people who were getting their heads chopped off were not dying due to the anomalous properties of Giza glass. Instead, their heads, just like Thomas Crawford's body, stayed alive and eventually morphed and inflated into these giant floating heads around the Grand Canyon. These floating heads would come to be known as canyon crowns and sightings of them increased more and more with time. President Rockefeller was debriefed on the situation in the Grand Canyon, the overpopulation of crowns due to the workings of Giza Guardians. While also being aware of the economic stagnation of the American economy at the time, he decided that a solution could be reached to kill two birds with one stone. He would sell the crowns to the Germans, both fixing the overpopulation of crowns and saving the US economy. Germans at the time were developing their bomber blimp airships. This was right before World War I. In secret interviews that were released after, Rockefeller states that Canyon Crowns were the perfect working force. Once they were conditioned and bound together, that the Crowns did not rebel, they did not speak, they could not leave, and they were chained. And best of all, Crowns were incapable of forming unions. Once the Germans discovered the Crowns in the Grand Canyon and their potential in warfare, they agreed to sign deals with Rockefeller for them, for a tremendous sum making one of the most destructible air forces at the time. And by World War I, these same weapons were used by Germans to kill other Americans. After World War I, the American public would come to know the connection that Rockefeller had with the Germans, although the existence of Canyon Crowns or their use is still unknown. This caused Rockefeller to feel even more regret and shame for his past actions, wishing at the end that he was never the president. During the Great War, after Germans began to attack the Americans and Europeans with airships they were provided by President Rockefeller, President Charles Evan Hughes had to thereafter carefully destroy the airships as to now reveal their true nature, the hiding beasts within them that allowed them to fly. This was done through several operations involving lasers utilizing Giza glass, including Operation Pyramid Plaza. The operation was a plan to destroy the Luschiff Rockefeller 70 as it flew over pyramids of Giza, utilizing a Giza glass powered laser called the Anti Airship Death Ray. 17 alumni of Florida University volunteered to help operate the Death Ray and are sent off to Giza in order to enact this plan. They set up the Death Ray atop the Great Pyramid, which is essentially a focused lens with Giza glass firing a beam of energy. When they go through with the activation of the ray, they successfully destroy the Rockefeller, but at the cost of the men being immediately vaporized. After their immediate vaporization, the men become amorphous, semi-conscious shells of what they once were, wandering the desert aimlessly to decipher the nature of their condition. When they finally decided to end their ambulation, they amalgamate into a single form, something greater than the sum of the parts. They no longer have to ambulate. In understanding the damning of their souls by Rockefeller, they begin an immediate flight to the United States. We then see in detail what had happened to the 17 men that manned the machine in five different stages. The first stage is disintegration. The men divide into microscopic parts, as the properties of the Giza glass weapon doesn't allow them to die, instead turns them into semi-conscious orbs of life energy. Second stage is ambulation, and it explains how the semi-conscious and unstable remains of the men that are left traverse the desert in an attempt to better understand their condition. The third stage is amalgamation, shows us as the 17 semi-conscious remains of the men fuse together into a more stable being. This being will come to know later as the fallen angel. And then in the fourth stage, it shows us as its fallen angel starts traveling back to its homeland, the US, traveling from Egypt all the way back to America, where it executes a counterattack. In the final stage, called retaliation, exacting its revenge on the one man that caused them to turn into this being, John D. Rockefeller. We then see that on May 23rd, 1937, President Rockefeller enters a bunker and was never seen again. After some investigations, the door of the bunker was found melted open with quote, possibly the most powerful heat ray ever built. 
there were two images of the potential suspect that were released. Both show a strange specter-like humanoid in the background, presumably the fallen angel himself. The angel would lay dormant for 66 years before the ADA find him. Once the advocates of the Division of America get a hold of the fallen angel, they trick the entity into exacting their plan. Without his knowledge, the angel is sent on a mission throughout America. On episode 5 of season 1, called Air Force One Angel, the episode begins by stating that on August 17, 2003, the Air Force One, which is a term used for the plane designated to transport the United States President, took an unannounced trip across the continental USA, and that many civilians reported seeing the aircraft dropping packages on various national monuments. These national monuments would just so happen to be Mount Rushmore, Alcatraz, and the Statue of Liberty after finally heading back to Washington DC. White House officials later disclosed that the unusual flight of the Air Force One was unauthorized and unmanned. The lone figure seen inside the plane, dubbed the Air Force One Angel, has yet to be identified by federal authorities. These unknown packages that it dropped would cause three consecutive events to take place around three locations. First. The drop on Mount Rushmore would cause an infection to begin on top of the heads of the carved figures, slowly growing what seems to be spikes on top of their heads, or perhaps special trees. The drop near the Liberty Statue would trigger the special trees inside the Washington Monument to awaken, break out of its shell, and activate. And the drop on Alcatraz awakens the island itself, turning it into a living organism able to move and duplicate itself. The Air Force One was shot down when it re-entered the restricted airspace of Washington DC. The reason why each monument reacted the way it did, or what the payload that was dropped was, is still unknown. But this incident would change the landscape of the US, causing each area of the infection to expand, and forcing the US government to change the way the border system worked, dividing America into three consecutive zones. The Alcatraz Zone, the Washington Zone, and the Rushmore Zone, with the Alcatraz Zone duplicating itself and expanding all the way to West Texas by 2020, and turning the US into the United Zones of America. By 2022, Alex's universe is an absolute mess. The zones expand without stopping. Strange things begin happening near the Pyramids of Giza. Creatures start awakening and walking the lands, and the Air Force One Angel, after learning that the ADA only used him as a weapon, would destroy them. This would in turn cause the government to locate the Air Force One Angel, finding it hiding in the Babylon Forest, finalizing everything with Operation Thunderbird, a plan for the government to destroy both freedom that is roaming free in the Grand Canyon and the Air Force One Angel, a plan to capture freedom bring it to the Air Force One Angel where both entities would battle it out. An unstoppable force versus an immovable object means mutually assured destruction. They are both eradicated. But in doing this and without knowing, the US government causes the destruction of planet Earth itself and the Deanverse. Unbeknownst to them, they have carried out what the ADA have wanted to do for so long. The horned serpent breaks out of its shell, hatching out of the earth like an egg and corrupting the Deanverse, causing its destruction. Shortly after destroying the earth, all of reality starts to split into many pieces. The dimensions begin folding on themselves, creating a corner world. This event is called the Great Division. The survivors of this Great Division are known as the Corner Folk. Alex would be thrown out of this world, landing in our world in 2016 where he begins his series, The Monument Mythos. The effect of his destruction and the collateral damage makes its way into another universe, another universe that we'll get to know as the Nixonverse. This is where Riley Tillen encounters these mysterious beings he calls the Corner Folk. They are what's left of the great destruction of Alex's universe. 
And this is where season 3 of the Mythos begins. No longer in a Deanverse, we are introduced into another universe, but we'll save that one for another video. One could speak about the Monument Mythos for hours on end and still fail to explain every detail and every hidden message, which is why I recommend everyone to go and watch the series by themselves. Because even though I tried my best to keep everything coherent, I still had to cut out multiple events and characters from the story. I'm talking about Sphinx spaceships, dimension traveling children, historical interviews, victims of Lincoln looking, and multiple storylines are all interlinked throughout episodes and so much more. I had to redo the entire video because I realized that when I did try to explain everything, episode by episode, the video would have far exceeded 4 hours. And even then, it would have been just a blabbering mess. And so I tried to keep it as short as possible so that you have the opportunity to experience this series for yourself. A series that is still going on as of today, as by the time I started and finished working on this video, Mr. Manicore uploaded 4 new episodes for season 3. I'm hoping that I'll make a full comprehensive video when that ends and try to connect everything but season 3 seems to be a whole entire beast on its own. But for now, if you made it all the way here, thank you for watching. Put your thoughts in the comment section below. Support the channel if you wish. And I will see you all very soon. Because after all, there is no house in the ocean.